Hi, Misha here. And this is kind of my... Sorry about the draw, so there guys. This is kind of my second look at American Bombers. In the first video, we checked out... I mean, the most iconic bomber, even more than the B-29. The B-17 Flying Fortress. Today, we check out another one of America's heavy bombers from the war. This is the consolidated B-24 Liberator. And this is the B-24D variant, which is was the first really mass-produced version. The H would have been kind of the definitive, the ultimate version, but this is the D. And as with the first model with the Boeing, this is a... 172 scale diecast from Corgi and it is also a big and heavy piece of kit the B24 Liberator is famous but today isn't quite as well known as the B17 or the B29 and the funny thing is, it was a very modern aircraft for its day and time. It was actually a little shorter than the B-17. It's only 67 feet long, but it has a wider wingspan of 110 feet. This wing is a more modern design. It was called the Davis Wing, named after its designer, developer, at Consolidated. As you see, it sits very high on the plane. And this allows for a higher speed, better fuel efficiency, and uh, more weight in the uh, in the bays or cargo, be it cargo or bombs. So it's kind of turning the stand. <laughs> Well, this plane has an interesting history. In 1938, the U.S. Army Air Corps approached Consolidated, who had made several maritime planes and flying boats, and they were talking to them about manufacturing the B-17 under license. Well, the management from Consolidated weren't initially against the idea, so they went to the Boeing factory and looked at the B-17 and how it was uh, made. They came back to the military and said, we can do something better. We can give you something with more range, more capacity, more speed. So the Army Air Corps at the time figured, why, why not? So they kind of issued a request in January of 39 for Consolidated to produce just such a plane. And they gave them a deadline of a prototype due by the end of the year. A deadline which Consolidated barely met by like two days. The prototype XB24 first flew on December 29th, 1939. So 1940 rolls around. Not only is the Army Air Corps interested, but uh, the governments of Britain and France are both interested. And for export, this was named the LB-30, for Land Bomber 30. Because of the way the procurement system was set up at the time, foreign contract orders were given priority over American contract orders. So, the first six planes that were ready went to the UK. And of course, once when France was invaded, the planes that they were going to receive ended up also going to the UK. So in 41, they were really were the first to put these into service. And they initially used them as transports more than actual bombers. 
Then they use them as an anti-submarine plane. As a transport, these would routinely cross the Atlantic. In fact, they were about the first airplane to be used as a routine Atlantic crosser. And at that time, you had what was basically the Battle of the Atlantic, or the Atlantic Gap, where there was no defense for convoys in the middle of the Atlantic, and so U-boats were picking them off. You know, you could have planes flying from North America, Canada, and even the U.S. once they entered the war, and you could have planes flying from the U.K., but they didn't have the range, for the most part, in the middle of the ocean, leaving a very dangerous gap for all the convoys. Well, with the B-29, excuse me, B-24, the gap was narrowed significantly. And these quickly became very popular as uh, anti-sub planes. They would use radar and became very effective at attacking subs at night. And uh, the British would coin them as the Liberator, so that name stuck. And uh, by the middle of 1943, the Atlantic Gap was completely closed, and uh, we could say that uh, if the war wasn't won there, the tide certainly turned in favor of the Allies. And 93 U-boats were sunk thanks to B-24's Liberators. So it achieved very early success there. America, the Air Corps, started receiving its first B-24s in the middle of 1941 and started to deploy them in Europe in 1942 as another heavy bomber. Again, it had better range and it could deliver more bombs than the B-17. However, this did come at a cost. This David's David sorry, this Davis wing was more susceptible to icing over than the larger, well, I should say wider and shorter B-17's wing. It was also more vulnerable, more delicate. So this plane wasn't as durable couldn't take as much punishment as the B-17. It was also pretty poor handling at lower speeds. It liked to go fast. And it was just generally considered by pilots to be a more difficult, less forgiving plane to fly. So, kind of the opposite of the B-17 in a lot of ways. But, on the other hand, it had a higher maximum speed of nearly 300 miles per hour and a much higher cruising speed than the B-17 at about 220 miles per hour. It had a lower ceiling. It could only get up to about 28,000 feet, but it had a longer range of up to 1,500 miles. And it had two bomb bays, and for short-range missions, 400 miles or less, it could carry essentially double the bomb load of the B-17. Even at longer ranges, it could still carry 5,000 pounds, or at extreme ranges, about 3,000 pounds. So it, it, it was still very significant. It had a crew of 11, and it had 10... 50 caliber Modus M2 machine guns. Turret in the back. It does have a belly turret, which is unfortunately kind of covered by my stand. You can put the stand forward, but mine likes to sit where it's at, or otherwise it's a little uneven, so the belly turret is covered. It's kind of neat on the Corgi because the belly turret is flexible and does fit up in little recesses. The reason the belly turret on these kind of had to tuck up into the plane was the landing gear were relatively short and there wasn't much ground clearance. So the turret actually had to be retracted and especially the guns had to be retracted into the fuselage for landings. Likewise, the two bomb bays, the doors, 
don't just open on hinges, you know, with flaps down. They actually roll, kind of like a garage door, up into the fuselage, which is good because on the ground, it uh, meant they could get to the bomb bay. Also, in the air, it gave less air resistance. Anyway, I digress. There are also two 50 cal guns on each side of the fuselage in the back there. So a total of five back there. Then we have a turret on the top. And then we have a rotating turret on the nose. So we have four guns up front and four pointing back and then two on the sides. So not quite as heavily armed and well covered as the fortress. But on the other hand, this was the first bomber to have a tricycle style landing gear. You know, the B-17, as you saw on the other model, the gear is kind of uh, exposed. It just folds up into the engine well there. So some trade-offs, but generally speaking, a more modern design. In fact, later versions of the B-24 would have an autopilot. Probably the earliest mission in Europe this is known for, in 1942, a baker's dozen of these, 13, attacked the oil fields in Poesti, Romania. Pretty small raid, but it, it proved the efficacy of this plane. There would be a repeat attack in July of... 43 with 177 planes and this second attack is much more famous because 54 planes were destroyed this is before fighter cover was adequate so yeah they pretty much were going on their own plus that and some other mishaps however despite the heavy loss of life and machine both primary objectives were obliterated and this was important because Romania was an ally of Germany, part of the Axis, and this deprived them of much needed petroleum, petrol, oil, as you will. So this was very famous for that. The B-24 was used as a bomber along with the B-17 in Europe, but really it was known for being a transport. As I said, anti-submarine, this role it would continue in. Also, it was an early user of electronic warfare. These would be flown to jam enemy radar, uh, confuse and convolute enemy communications, and uh, actually would be tested out with some early versions of uh, guided munitions. Uh, you know, kind of radio guided bombs and stuff would be tried out on this plane. So a lot of early tech was um, demoed on the B-24. Also beginning in 1943, they would start Operation Carpetbagger, where these would be painted black and flown at night and drop supplies to aid friendly resistance and underground units through all throughout unit, excuse me, Europe, giving them, you know, whatever they might need. It would also be used to pick up escaped POWs, prisoners, and sometimes spies with important things. And unfortunately, these missions, because they were kind of low-flying and everything, had a high attrition rate, but the pilots did it because it greatly aided the war effort, and this was done in cooperation with the OSS office. So it definitely saw a lot of use. This particular model here from Corgi is an example of a so-called mail call flown by Jimmy Stewart, the actor, during the war. He operated it 44 through 45. The B-24 would also be very famous in the Pacific, whereas the B-15, excuse me, the B-17 was a bad fit for that environment. The B-24, thanks to its range and uh, speed and capacity, was a much better fit for the Pacific. 
So these started to be used quite heavily in 1943 and throughout the remainder of the war. They even tried out some of their new fancy guided munitions against Japanese railways, railheads, and uh, ships and harbors and to great success, frankly. And again, the British would continue to fly their liberators. So despite the plane's shortcomings of not being as durable and being a little more difficult to uh, take into the air for the pilots, it still had a lot of uh, things going for it, mostly capacity. And as a transport, it could carry a lot of troops or a lot of material. In fact, in 1944, B-24s were used to supply petrol, gasoline, to George Patton when his army outran his supply chains and he was kind of stuck and needed gas. So the B-24 Liberator came to Patton's rescue as well. These are made at a total of five factories. Of course we have Consolidated who actually had, you know. They were also made at Bell and Douglas. And Ford would be very famous for producing the B-24. In fact, they made the most of them. They even made what they called knockdown kits, where they would essentially put all the parts together in a box and ship them to places like Douglas. And uh, they would go ahead and put the rest of them together. Oh, sorry, the other one was North American. I got myself distracted thinking ahead. That was early on, you know, 42, 43, that was happening. By 44, they had scaled it back to Ford and consolidated, but it still, production was immense. In fact, 18,500 B-24s were produced. That makes this the most heavily produced bomber of World War II. The most heavily produced American military aircraft of all time the most heavily produced multi-engine American aircraft, and so on and so on. Needless to say, they made a lot of them. And I think part of it was it could be used not only as a bomber, but as a, a patrol craft, a search and rescue craft, a transport. These are quite famous for going over the, quote, hump over India. And actually, they would be used very heavily after the war to get men and materiel over to Japan, China, and the Philippines to help rebuild. So they were used extensively in peacetime as well. In the Navy, the original version was known as the PB-4Y, which was basically just a B-24. And this would lead to the more specialized, but still very similar, PB-4Y2 Privateer. So that was the navalized version. Again, it was a great submarine hunter. And for its day and time, its capacity and range was very good. As far as the Corgi model itself, it has a lot of the same features as the... Uh, B-17, the turret rotates, front turret rotates. As I said, the belly turret rotates and actually pulls down, which is kind of neat. We have this very distinctive tail, which was actually taken off one of... Uh, Consolidated maritime planes. They did experiment with a single vertical tail, and it had many benefits. They probably would have gone to it later in production, but the war ended, so they did not. If 
very heavy. I think the B-17 model is maybe a little heavier, but I could just be wrong. This has more of a square fuselage. And of course the higher wing. But uh, very cool. I don't think this model is still in production, but I think you can still find them. If not, there are other B-24s available. It's of course got a wingspan. It's about 20 inches, give or take, maybe in a little more. And it's a good foot long. A very impressive. And a key part of American and British history. Well guys, that's about all I've got to say right now. If you have any questions or comments, please do post them below. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. Otherwise, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.